Welcome to We Play Games. I'm Walker, and here we are in Crusader Kings 2 in order to film a CK3 After the End lore video. So why are we in CK2? Well, the reason is that the CK2 version, this is the After the End fan fork um, for patch 3.3.3, I think, um, but this is an incredibly detailed story, and so I just wanted to share a little bit of this incredibly detailed story with you, not because this is going to be the story of the CK3 version. In fact, we know in some ways, meaning Thankfully, it's going to change, but because I think it kind of gives you an idea for the way that the team is going to tell a story to us in Crusader Kings 3, because they're going to. I don't want anyone to think that the story that we have so far is the end of it. So we've already done a video here on the Ghosts of the North in Crusader Kings 3. So why don't we look at the Cru at Ghosts of the North in Crusader Kings 2? So when we look at the Ghosts of the North in CK2, we see that it's highlighting some of the same themes that are being highlighted in the CK3 version of the mod, right? Anabaptists here under the Dytri are present both in the CK2 and the CK3 versions of the mod because they tell the same story. They tell the same story of people who are already agriculturally focused, that is, the Amish and the Mennonites, they are going to continue to have those sort of social patterns in place, both before and after the apocalypse, because they have a monopoly on a continuity of life, they are able to rapidly expand in the area that they, they currently live in. But you can see that there's still quite a lot of religious diversity here in the Crusader Kings 2 version of the mod, with some cultural diversity as well, but you'll notice that they in the CK2 version of the mod, there isn't an urban-rural divide here in New England, whereas in the CK3 version there is, right? In the CK3 version we have Letterman down here in the south, and then we have Lobsterman up here in the north, and then we have Yankee in the deep forest. And that highlights that in the CK3 version of the mod, they are really taking extra steps to try to explain how the collapse of an industrial society would impact the people who are living there. Whereas I feel more in the CK2 version of the mod, they're just trying to describe a, a fun and compelling story, right? A fun and compelling story full of fun and compelling characters. We're gonna load up Paul and we're gonna look at Paul's uh, family history and then we'll probably bounce to another character. So here we have the CK2 version of Paul Mahonek. He still is basically the same character, right? Ambitious and brave. Um, he's a skilled tactician and a strong warrior. It's a, it's a similar character. The history of the Mahonic house is way more fleshed out in the CK2 version of the mod. And I that's just a temporary thing, right? That's a temporary thing that they are going to change as they begin to write it out. The story that they tell in the history of the house is, I think, really cool. So we, I think the easiest way to check it is by checking on your title history. And I think that's gonna be true in the CK3 version of the mod as well, because the, the title history of the Kingdom of New England tells you kind of about the rise of the Mahonic dynasty under Vincent. This may change in the CK3 version of the mod. It looks like um, they are saying that the first king of New England is King Sidrach. The the story and the actual and the specific characters of the CK2 version of the mod might not carry over to the CK3, but they they'll tell a really fun story no matter what. But in the CK2 version, we've got um, King Vincent. He's the one who forms the Kingdom of New England. His son. Keziah dies in the original lore for After the End prior to Fanfork. Keziah dies in battle against Elias Rodham um, out of out of Hudsonia. But in here they have Keziah committing suicide. It's fine. And then you can see af after the death of Keziah, there's a couple of these Mahonics in here who are just not particularly capable leaders. And then we have the collapse of the Mahonic dynasty because we have here Vincent II being slain by King Solomon of New England, which is a, a king dynasty character. And then the last of the Mahonics to claim the kingship, um, King Heligor, dying in battle against King Malcolm the, of King Malcolm, who in turn was murdered by his son, King Jacob, who not only murdered his father, but also murdered his brother, and then was in turn killed by King Owen of Fenmore, and then the Fenmores held the title until it collapsed. What this should tell you broadly is the story of the Kingdom of New England also tells the story of the people living there, right? What this story tells you on the, in a broad sense is there was a Mahonic king, the Mahonic king unified New England, 
the opponent king also caused an awful lot of problems for uh, his enemies out there, and so they eventually assassinated him. His son ended up committing suicide while leading, well, doing something. And then the the empire slowly weakened until eventually there was enough instability that the Mahonics or the founding dynasty lost lost a monopoly on power within the kingdom. And then other families displaced the Mahonics as being the the preeminent forces in New England. And then eventually the the title became defunct as the, the rulers became weaker and weaker through instability and murder and chaos. And so that's that is exactly what this story, the title history, tells you. And that kind of storytelling is kind of what I expect we will see in this in the Crusader Kings 3 version of the mod once they've had time to add a whole lot of title history. I think I think we're gonna see a really, really cool world being built from them. To highlight for the people who haven't played the CK3 version, not only is there a like an urban rural divide here in New England. There's also a division within the occultists. In the old version of the mod, the occultists are essentially all diabolists. They all worship the the dark spirits and the evil part of the occultist faith in Crusader Kings 3. Whereas in CK3, this religion, occultist, is actually split up into multiple different religions, and occultist is instead a faith, which is like a, a super religious type. And so we have diabolists who are living out in the rural areas, and then you have Salemites along the coast and in the urban areas. And the Salemites, rather than worshiping the old gods, they fear them and they seek to prevent their, their re-emergence. Yeah, I think the, the religious map mode for CK2 after the end kind of highlights where the CK3 team is coming from, the things that they are using. Obviously, the map is not nearly as extensive. You can see here that we don't have anything north of the 60, pretty much, and down here we also don't have we don't have access to Brazil, but that's because Brazil is using the Crusader Kings 2 China mechanics. That's a an interesting thing that they do not currently have in Crusader Kings 3. But yeah, the, I think the religious map mode does a great job of highlighting kind of where the mod is coming from when you're looking at the CK3 version of the, of the mod, because a lot of the things are kind of there. The headcanon that I'm working with that was suggested by someone on Reddit is that what we're seeing out uh, in the world is actually just the recordings of a Catholic monk, maybe a Catholic monk working in, in St. Louis for the Pope or something like that, because the CK2 version of the mod doesn't highlight the differences outside of uh, the Catholic world quite as well as the CK3 version of the mod. And so that headcanon, I think, is just kind of cute. But even in the CK2 version of the mod, you know, like, look around, there's there are small, there are ethnic and religious minorities all over the world. Like, there's an Americanist in, in Cincinnati. There's uh, this Amir, Amir Amon Jafar of Suncoast and Ali Fabulous He down here in Florida. There's diaspora communities, the, the Hindus here in Trinidad, who we will go over in the CK3 After the End lore video series, I promise. I just wanted to do a, a video about the CK2 version of the mod because it, it had been a while since I booted it up. It's beautiful, by the way. If you're just like a relentless After the End addict and you haven't played the CK2 version of the mod, you should. It's fun. It. I think the CK2 three version does seem like it's it's going to surpass it but there's a lot of fun storytelling in here for instance california so california in the ck2 version of the mod starts way way weaker than it does in the ck3 version of the mod i kind of expect that to change we'll find out but in the ck2 two version of the mod, you start as a one province miner. The Yudko dynasty was in charge instead of the Talenke, but it looks like the Talenke are, are the new canon for uh, CK3 after the end. Uh, but it's the same story, basically, right? There was a, a powerful ruler who united California, including negotiating, for instance, uh, the annexation or vassalization of this Abbas dynasty here down here in uh, Southern California. But in the CK2 version of the mod, California has a lot more of the, the Chinese flavor and characteristics that are also shared with Brazil. But instead of being a China that's powerful, it's a China that's fragmented and controlled by warlords. Because out here in California, 
um, the Emperor Elton Yudko can only claim control over Sacramento itself. And then all of the rest of what you have to do as California is just is diplomacy, right? You need to find your way uh, with your 852 army levies to fight off your enemies. Right outside, you've got the King Pollock of the Valley who is going to try to attack you sooner or later. California is a very different kind of game in Crusader Kings 2 than it is in Crusader Kings 3. In CK3, they represent the weakness of California by having non-existent vassal obligations in, in the titles. But in CK2, we have actually independent warlords in control of the overwhelming majority of California. I'm kind of curious to see how they take that um, in the CK3 version of the mod, because I think that CK2, I might even just do a, a run of like the Yudko dynasty or something like that in California and CK2, because I think they're fun. I would like to see them make it a even more Romance of the Three Kingdoms than this is. So here in the CK2 version, we have one, two, three, four, five, kind of six main warlord states. That's not a lot, though. If you're familiar with Chinese history and Romance of the Three Kingdoms in particular, then for those of you who've played that video game, uh, that video game series, you'll know that there are going to be like dozens of warlords in those games that are fighting against each other for power. I would love to see that in the CK3 version of the game. We'll find out where the team takes California. But the basic flavor of somebody unifies California by negotiating alliances and being diplomatic while also using the spiritual authority that comes from founding a religion, that flavor is consistent between the CK2 and the CK3 version of the mod. In the CK2 version of the mod, they, they do have some indigenous faiths as well. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce some of them. I'm a chicken. Call me out in the comments if you want to. You can see pretty clearly that indigenous faiths are still very important here in, in the Yucatan. And I think that makes sense, right? That this is gonna be a this is gonna be a part of the world where without industrialization, you're gonna have urban centers basically disappear uh, in most of the Yucatan, most likely, and probably the return of slash and burn agriculture in a lot of areas just due to the nature of trying to farm in a in a rainforest. And we see enormous swaths of nomadic territory practicing indigenous faiths. But we do see, generally speaking, just way fewer overall religions. And that's simply a function of the game itself, right? That even if the CK2 After the End mod team had really wanted to go absolutely crazy with religions here, I don't know if they could have gotten away with it. Because, see, this game's ancient. This game's from, like, 2012 or something like that. But I also want to just let you know that we do have Levi the Liberator here in the CK2 version of the mod, as well as in the CK3, which tells me that, yeah, the, the team for CK3 is going to carry over lore from CK2 where they feel it's appropriate. And so don't think that just because some of the religions have changed and some of the cultures have changed that the things that you know about after the end, if you've played a lot of Crusader Kings 2, don't think that those are no longer useful because they absolutely are. But don't be prejudiced, right? That the new content is extremely well researched and has a lot of homework behind it. And the flavor that the mod team is adding to the different religions and different cultures, I think is gonna make the world feel a lot more alive because it really has to me so far. Like I, I normally would have restarted a run already and gone on to play in a different part of the world, but I've been playing on the same campaign file and having an absolute, an absolute blast. And it's because of the amount of flavor that's already in the game, even if we're missing out on some of the history that's in the game. If there's anything from the CK2 version that you want me to go over in more precise detail, just let me know in the comments. I'm happy to play as a character here. I just wanted to do a brief video on the lore of Crusader Kings 2 after the end fan fork. So that way for the people who are new to the series or old to the series, uh, have something to pin the new mod against. Okay, that's Walker, take care.